welcome everyone to this Instagram live interview. Um, today we're going to be talking about bottom-up approaches. That was uh, pretty much what was interesting and what I think we at FUF really wanted to learn more about. Um, like uh, the Hunger Project, these are organizations that deal with these, these methods. So uh, we have uh, Tishome Shibru, who is the country director for the Hunger Project Ethiopia, who's here uh, and will talk to us about this for the next half an hour. To interview uh, Tishome, we have Joel Bernersson, who is a quality strategist at the International Center for Local Democracy. I hope we have a great conversation uh, and I hope we can also learn a lot. So welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to this conversation with the uh, uh, Swedish Development Forum. Um, so uh, as Axel mentioned, during today's discussion, we're going to explore how community-led movements uh, are empowered to address ongoing crisis of health, nutrition and food security in Ethiopia. So today we have over 700 million people in the world that are suffering from chronic hunger. And the Hunger Project has a holistic model for building a path towards self-reliance for vulnerable communities and to promote community-led development. And we're also going to look especially into the role that uh, young women, uh, young people and women uh, play in uh, these movements. Uh, so let me just start first by introducing you myself. Uh, my name is Joel Vanerson and I work for the Swedish International Center for Local Democracy. So I'm coming to you live here in, uh, from Visby uh, in our office. And I'm very happy to be here since I actually first took my steps in this office as a member of the uh, FUF uh, uh, internship program, which I know currently is open for, for application. So I recommend everyone to, to go in and check, uh, check that out. It could be a good opportunity to, uh, to take a step into, into the development sector. Uh, but today I'm uh, very excited to be joined by uh, you, uh, Tishome Shibru, uh, Country and Regional Director for the Hunger Project in Ethiopia. Uh, so, Tishome, thanks for uh, coming to this conversation. Uh, and I just want to start by uh, sort of asking a broader question, trying to get the viewers uh, to get an opportunity to understand the context of your work uh, and what your organization is trying to address. So, how is the current situation? How would you describe it in terms of food security and health where you're working in Ethiopia? And how is the Hunger Project working to, to address those issues? Thank you, Heil, for having me. Uh, the current situation in Ethiopia regarding hunger and nutrition is, uh, I can say, very dire. Uh, we have already a large, large amount of children stunted, like from 35 up to 40 percent of uh, our uh, children stunted. And also due to uh, the obvious uh, reasons that uh, everybody of you may might know that uh, we are in a conflict situation and added to this is also just the challenge of climate change uh, affecting our food security in Ethiopia <clears throat> that is hampering uh, food production. We were just emerging from the effects of uh, COVID uh, and followed by the uh, global conflict which disrupted many of the supply systems uh, and now we are uh, in the conflict in Ethiopia, one of the biggest uh, regions in Ethiopia is in conflict uh, situation. So the hunger uh, issue is very, very dire in our country and it demands a lot of community-led and uh, grassroots level uh, efforts uh, to cope with the situation. Yeah, and the, your your method of working, you have a unique approach in the Hunger Project called called the epicenter uh, model, um, epicenter approach, and that's where rural areas are organized and supported from the village level in order to achieve self reliance. Um, so, uh, I'd like to touch a little bit upon that uh, model. Like, what makes this approach unique? How does it work on the ground? Can you can you provide some examples of how you uh, you work with these issues? Yeah. Our grassroots level approach uh, in which we empower the communities to be self reliant to be confident uh, in ending their own hunger is that uh, we start, uh, we say we start with women, which we really do. And uh, so in doing so, we start with <coughs> a tool called DCA, 
vision, commitment, and action. We conduct a lot of uh, workshops in areas where we operate uh, to exercise community visioning to vis for communities to vision their own future and agree on a vision, like the uh, vision setting. Based on that, communities uh, also develop action, what we call like uh, strategic plan in action. <clears throat> Yeah, we do uh, these things uh, through uh, our project field officers and volunteers. During the workshops, uh, we facilitate the election of every 150 uh, members, clusters of families will elect a man and a woman animator. We call them animator, which are community leaders. So depending on the level of the targets, we have as many volunteers uh, as, as, as needed, that is community level uh, volunteers. Uh, in addition to the general workshops we conduct in the communities, we train these uh, leaders, uh, community leaders, animators. We train them on uh, like mindset training in which uh, we encourage deeper thinking and uh, uh, confidence building and we go on like leadership training, basic leadership, uh, and also facilitation uh, training. In addition to the, the issues we address like nutrition, uh, sanitation, uh, food security, livelihoods, uh, landscape restoration, which is resilience uh, building. Uh, so in doing so, we we also train, uh, continue training the community members on their rights, their entitlements, and we also, while doing so, we also engage local government because we see that uh, we believe that leveraging local the government is a very key issue for sustainability. In addition to the community, so uh, communities. Uh, uh, <coughs> Regarding the services, uh, these uh, community leaders who are educated in different areas like their rights, their entitlements, uh, will be facilitated to conduct uh, like a community scorecard. They visit different service product providers in the government. Uh, like if it is uh, water, they visit water facilities. If it is health issue, they visit health facilities, uh, schools and all relevant uh, service provi providing uh, institutions locally and then uh, they come up with a with with a list of activity list of uh, list of uh, activities that are not implemented according to the standards and entitlements and also which are not implemented then we organize or facilitate interface meetings between the government uh, who, uh, uh, service provider and the community and discuss issues why the services are not uh, up to the standards then we start planning mm -hmm. so now what we brought to the community that is our projects will be coming into the picture so we plan based on what resources the community have what resources the government have, what gaps are observed during the community scorecard and plan and implement together. So this way, communities are will become uh, build confidence, uh, believe in themselves, doing whatever they want, whatever matters for them, and also government partners also become part of the the, the process with the community and they contribute uh, uh, to what we are going to implement. This way, we start from the uh, grassroots, from the community, and implement our project. It's, it's not like we go simply and say that, you, you people, we, have, we came up with this and this project, and we want you to do this and that. Because it's like training first, empowering first, then planning together, and implement together through our volunteers. We usually have very few staff on the field. We very much rely on community volunteers that we, I said, we recruited 
and also government uh, officers who work village level. There are village level uh, officers in areas of agriculture, health, uh, animal husbandry, and all kinds of activities. So we integrate everything together and work with the community and the local government, leveraging both the local government and empowering the community. Uh, so with this, we believe that even if when we finish the project and go out, we already established a very uh, strong uh, relationship uh, between the community and the government. And uh, it is very likely that uh, the project will continue. And the communities stop seeing their local government as masters, uh, as, as people who are there to watch over them and then the, uh, the government officers uh, seeing community uh, feelings that they are there to uh, control the community uh, and things like that. So we create a makeable uh, cooperative uh, situation and uh, implement the projects. This is how our uh, uh, approach works on the ground. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, at, at the outset of your interventions, you start by empowering women. Uh, and if you look at the broader uh, East African region, there are a lot of powerful patriarchal norms in society, in communities. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what obstacles are there for, for women to gain economic and political power in Ethiopia? And how do you work to, to empower them as uh, change agents? Yeah, uh, as you rightly said, women are marginalized, I can say, in our societies, in our communities, in Africa, in Ethiopia, and everywhere. One, one uh, uh, aspect of this is they are limited access to finance, limited access to knowledge, limited access to uh, empowerment and other services. Uh, you can name it, lo lots of it. So what we do is along these uh, VCA workshops, we organize an, uh, in all our projects, we organize women conversation and saving groups. That is only women, uh, women are part of, uh, women are uh, members at every cluster of villages. In a village, uh, there are like seven to eight clusters which constitute 150 uh, members. So all the women, the young and the mothers will come together in their villages, like in group of 30, 40, uh, and discuss any matter that important for them. And at the end, they, they save some money, whatever the amount, they save some money. We provide them uh, with passbook and a small uh, uh, box that they can keep uh, the money they uh, save. And they elect their leaders like the chairwoman and the treasurer and the one who who, 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 who keeps regardless. So they exercise like this while we do uh, uh, this VCA workshops, uh, animators, the women also in parallel do this kind of activities. They decide the, 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 the time interval they meet, like they can meet monthly, uh, they can say that weekly, and they exercise these kinds of activities. Look, in this process, they learn leadership because they have a chair, they have treasurer, they have uh, Ricard, uh, who keeps Ricard, and they start asserting their views, and they, all the, they discuss uh, local norms, they discuss maternal health, they discuss, uh, we facilitate, we provide them with, with different uh, inputs that help them discuss. So, like, as, it's this, this happens for like six months minimum. Sometimes it goes for one year. Then we have programs in our pro projects. We have programs of microfinance, which we established my, primary microfinance at village level, which uh, connect later at uh, district level as union. So when we launch this microfinance program, look, women now have savings their own saving. They have, they have experience in financial matters, in other matters, they are assertive, uh, they exercise leadership, and we 
mobilize all people from the village and launch the formation of microfinance in institution. In this process, now they use the money they saved to purchase uh, shares from microfinance and become a member. They use also their leadership skills they uh, exercised in the small clusters and become assertive, uh, uh, talk on the meetings, they know about the importance of saving and credit, and elected. So naturally, in, in, in some cases, the leadership of that microfinance will become like 70%, 60% dominated by women mm. because of the activities we did. So this is a matter of bringing women uh, up and uh, to be equal with men. Finance, access to finance, and access to and uh, the capacity to do engage in businesses, the key important, the first step to empower women. And economically empowered uh, women with agency is likely to grow uh, up, up in the ladder of the social ladder uh, in their communities, becoming even elected to the higher uh, bodies like uh, district level, uh, councils, and, and so on. <clears throat> so this is one thing when we say we start with women, that is what we do. In parallel to the workshop to the overall community, we have also uh, women uh, empowerment uh, activities like which I uh, explained. So I think I think you very uh, in a very um, uh, easily understood way also like explains the the holistic approach of engaging women and allowing them to also take space politically because economic self alliance is also tied to the ability to be able to engage in politics and to make your your voices heard. But how how do you engage? You, you spoke also about the local government level and engaging with the duty bearers, uh, politicians, so civil servants. Like in a lot of places where ICLD work, we do see that women are often locked out of, of uh, formal positions of power, not as represented. Uh, there's many, many examples of that, both in Eastern and Southern Africa. How do you engage with power holders and duty bearers in local government and try to, uh, to link that gap uh, for, for women uh, to not only be empowered in the grassroots, but also be formally represented in, in systems of, of local government? Yeah, um, as I said, uh, the key issue to be to become uh, involved in uh, local politics, uh, in local uh, uh, corridors of power is agency is first. Yeah. That, that is what, what we do uh, during this uh, uh, village level or neighborhood level women conversation and saving group. The conversation part is uh, about diff different issues. It involves all kinds of local, social, and political matters. Most of the issues are uh, are not different from politics. Uh, for example, like uh, budget uh, monitoring, expenditure tracking issues, uh, and prioritization of uh, community level activities, such as, for example, there is a government budget coming from in the form of block grant and in prioritization of this, those issues, these women leaders and the animators are the key participants on those issues. And in doing so, they engage with local political uh, leaders. They, became, they, they start to see those leaders like they are, even in some cases, they are better than those leaders uh, who, 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 who they elected and they advise them, uh, they uh, assert themselves uh, in, providing, uh, in providing ideas on how to prioritize issues. When they do like this um, community scorecard, who are participants, the participants of this community score, scorecard are those women leaders and those uh, as the, animat as the animators who selected. When doing so, they go to the offices, for the uh, offices of the local government. They discuss with them. They critically value because, uh, as I said before, we educate them on their rights, entitlements, and the standards. For example, it's nothing. 
which is written in the, in the government policies, standards. For example, there are health standards, there are uh, water uh, service uh, standards, there are so many standards, educational standards, we educate them on those. Understanding those, in some cases, they are even better than the, some of the government officers due to this education. Yeah. Because most of the people don't even read, uh, even in the government sector, there are people who don't read policies and the entitlements of the community, rights of the community. And so they are smart. And that's why I said that during election, like uh, for uh, local uh, councils, district level councils, these people are very, very agile and easily get elected. Then they are also very active in those councils, yeah. which, makes, which, which makes them again candidate for upper level, like zonal level, regional level, uh, representation of the uh, representation uh, of the community it's, these are men and women equally participate participated in this process in, in some cases the women are because of the uh, our uh, separate treatment through this community conversation and saving group that they are in excels in some instances because of the obvious reason, women are very uh, agile in uh, leadership, in management, uh, especially financial management, economic uh, activities like income generation activities. So uh, this, this makes them to join and go up in the political ladder, uh, we, we believe so. The, uh, the issue, uh, the, the only challenge is that uh, in some in some instances that the level of education uh, um, is 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 a problem uh, that is uh, uh, illiteracy in our cases in rural areas is like fifty percent so uh, uh, this this is uh, one challenge but these days there are a lot of girls going to school uh, even going up uh, in in in, in the, like uh, the second, uh, third tertiary of uh, uh, education, and we mobilize those young mothers and the young girls also to join this process and become leaders of their communities. Yeah, and that's a key lesson to be learned. To like, in order to uh, to allow vulnerable groups to engage in politics, it's important to both build capacity at the grassroots level among the community, but also to engage with the, the duty bearers at the at the local government level, and to to capacity build them into taking uh, rights holders' perspective, perspectives into account. And that's also something that that the ICLD works a lot with. We work more, more from the duty bearer perspective, but always trying to almost force them together with the, the rights bearers, with vulnerable groups, to collaborate to open up venues for, uh, for, for engagement and for dialogue. Yeah. Uh, but I want to I wanna turn to, uh, because we have a question in the chat regarding the, the conflict dimension of working in, in Ethiopia. And uh, as, uh, as a lot of people know, and as you mentioned also in the beginning, uh, conflict and ethnic divides is, is, the, is a very common uh, uh, division within communities in Ethiopia. And there's a lot of armed conflicts as well. And when speaking about human rights and sustainable development, I think the conflict dimension is, is impossible to, to leave out. So there's been conflicts in Tigray, in Oromia, Amara, and other areas. And I think there's uh, about 3 million people that are internally displaced in Ethiopia at the moment. So uh, given all these ethnic divides and conflicts in the area, how do you navigate these conflicts uh, uh, when, in, when doing your interventions, when you're engaging the local community and trying to prevent ethnic discrimination within communities where you engage? Uh... Uh, you know, you know we, we work at grassroots level, more or less, like uh, the same people, same ethnic groups at local level, but conflict can come to that community. For example, this, we have projects in Amhara where currently there is a lot of uh, conflict situation. Yeah. But, but this process we were doing when we, in, when we start the project, helped us to navigate this process. How? We empowered the community to do project activities. And there are 
so many leaders, community leaders in our projects. We almost, uh, I'm not speaking about other NGOs, we, all, we, we didn't stop our projects in Amhara, for example, because banks are working, we just transfer banks, and community leaders are taking it for a while with some engagement. They, they advise our uh, local project officers, now the security is not bad, because they made tele tele uh, telephone discussion with our project officers, and they say that now it is okay, we can do such and such things, we can uh, uh, engage in agroforestry, we can engage in uh, like uh, animal husbandry activities, we can engage in, in like uh, uh, services of like animal breed improvement, like artificial insemination. So the community leaders are, these volunteers are like our project officers. And we, we manage to continue the project. And but, but this is evident. So if, it's, if uh, it's such kind of approach also insulates the, the project from vulnerability or damage by local uh, forces who, 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 who are not empowered or who will not see those project activities, initiatives as external. Now, we, even the government uh, officers are not as accessible as we are to the rural areas where conflict is happening. Because we have our animators, our community leaders, women leaders are there on the ground and we manage to continue our, uh, most of our project activities. Of course, yeah. some project activities like uh, landscape restoration, uh, like tree planting and activities are affected because of the obvious reason, because it happens in uh, uh, forest areas. So except those, we manage to implement. So my, empowering community to lead their own development helps even in challenging times. This is yeah. what I can say, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to finally move to the perspective of, uh, of young people in your inter interventions. So if you look at the median age of, uh, of the population of Ethiopia, it's, it's at the moment it's below 19 years old. Yeah. And compared to uh, Sweden, we are we're above 40 years old in the median age. That tells you something about the demographics of the country and the importance of including young people in, in political processes and, and in leading the community. But I, I experience sometimes when, when traveling to these countries with ICLD that there are there's norms in society to defer to the elders usually and to respect the elders and for youth not to really make their voices heard in the same rooms as, as the elders sometimes when you have participatory processes. How, how do you work to constructively engage young people in, in your uh, community uh, engagements and to raise them as grassroots leaders? And do you think that digital solutions uh, like play a part uh, here also? Do you use digital solutions to engage them? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you said rightly that we are quite young population and we have to cater for the needs, aspirations of the young people. And we as much as possible try to engage the youth in our uh, project activities, different kinds of project activities. And even in our project partners, community partners, are due to these uh, demographic reasons, are mainly used. If you see women groups, there are a lot of youth, but mothers, uh, young mothers, and young farmers are part of the project. But there are certain youth groups that need also uh, different uh, approaches. They educated, somehow educated, and could not either access uh, employment in, in urban areas or also not happy jo back, joining back the, to the agriculture. So we started such in initiative as like making us agriculture smart for the use. That is, uh, uh, this is in a process. We are not yet uh, uh, implemented much due to uh, uh, mainly, uh, mainly uh, so to accommodate use 
for example we initiate value chains agricultural value chains for example dairy value chain in which uh, locally you use who are educated work in workshops like dairy processing uh, workshops uh, which collect uh, milk from the local farmers because i said that we do animal breed improvement and uh, rangeland management activities so they engage in such kinds of activities like local job creation the other is also the the the, the we encourage mechanization of uh, the farmers like local uh, businessmen local farmers who purchase tractors combiners so that and recruit they use to conduct farming activities uh, which is friendly and which is uh, attractive for the use to co to conduct farming like others and like their ancestors so yeah like establishing a sort of like a, a company local company that uh, leads tractors and other uh, farm machineries so that the youth will get employment and also the farmers uh, back in the field with uh, less labor. These are the initiatives that we are promoting, like through digital uh, processes like uh, leasing for agricultural farms. The other is also digitally, uh, I think the youth need to uh, access digital services like farm services, in which we provide information uh, like soil information, uh, weather information, because these are educated and more agile to use uh, such digital services and help also their farmers. So making agriculture more use-friendly, educated use-friendly is one of the strategies we are uh, trying to promote uh, in areas where we work. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tishome. And I just want to end on, on this note that I think uh, the work that the Hunger Project is doing is an, is an excellent way to, to be able to take the views and perspective of vulnerable groups into account and create a holistic approach to build long-term capacity, both among communities to, to claim their rights and also to engage the rights of the duty bearers in the local government to be able to, to, to include the voices of these people. I am going to be so bold as to, to, to ask you one final question, which is that I think a lot of people who are listening to this uh, are very uh, impressed by the work you're doing and the importance of what you're doing. So how can people do to, to support your work and to engage with, uh, with your work? Yeah, people can support us in different ways. Uh, private investors, private donors can contribute small amounts for like, we have different offices uh, in Europe, like uh, TFG, the Hunger Project Sweden is one of them, and people who live uh, and support, who, who believe in, an, uh, in our work can support in any small, no, 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 there is no small contribution. Okay, it is a small thing that there is an Ethiopian say, uh, saying that uh, a single apple is like an ornament for a, uh, for, for, for a group, but 50 is a burden. So if one contributes, if everybody contributes one apple, so it, it will be like, it's be like uh, providing a small gift and an ornament. So people can support us in this way. The other is uh, uh, anyone can learn from us and work from from us, like in, in group, in consortium, like-minded NGOs or uh, civil society groups can uh, join us and work uh, in Ethiopia. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Tishome. And as we say in Sweden, Monga Becker is more bilans or or. So if you go to the Hunger Project's website, you can support them. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for, for the opportunity to moderate this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, you will and Tashome for uh, a really interesting interview. Uh, thank you, Tashome. He's flying back to Addis Ababa tomorrow. So it was great to have him here for this. And thank you so much, you will, for your uh, interesting questions. I think we went a bit over time, so I hope everyone's okay with that. Uh, and we had a bit of a hiccup, but um, we will, as I said, put that uh, in one video on uh, Fuf's YouTube channel. Uh, I hope we answered your uh, question. Uh, I forgot the name now, but uh, yes. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Bye-bye. Thank you.